Please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, back to that portion of Scripture that we read just a few moments ago. We're in Exodus chapter 12, looking at a very important passage of Scripture and certainly one that ties in both with the Lord's table today, which we'll be partaking of not too long from now, and also with Christmas, the birth of a lamb announced to shepherds who were raising lambs that were used in the temple sacrifices, born in the city of David, the great shepherd psalmist, whose psalm we have just read, Psalm 23, just a few moments ago. Wonderful how we see those things tied together in one person, the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now what we've seen so far in relation to Passover is that God gave seven feasts to Israel. Passover is one of the seven divine feasts given to Israel, which is also explained in the New Testament and which is fulfilled in Christ. But in addition to the divine feasts, which are given to the Jews in the book of Exodus, the Jews also have instituted two other feasts, which are likewise mentioned in the New Testament. The Feast of Purim, that of course goes back to the days of Esther. Purim means lots, as they cast lots. It was instituted by Mordecai at the suggestion of Esther to remind the Jews of how God had delivered them from their enemy Haman. The other feast, which we're going to see a little bit more about today, as we tie it in with Passover, is the Feast of Hanukkah. That's not commanded by God in the Torah, but it actually begins today at sunset. Perhaps you are aware of that. Hanukkah is an eight-day feast. It begins today at sunset. It ends next Monday on December 14th at sunset. Hanukkah is called the Feast of Lights. It's also called in the New Testament the Feast of Dedication. It's mentioned in John chapter 10, verse 22. The Feast of Dedication is always celebrated in the Jewish calendar on the 25th of Chislu, which is the Jewish month that roughly corresponds to our month of December. As you know, the Jews have 30 days in their months, and so it doesn't work out always exactly on the same day, just like Resurrection Sunday does not always come at the same time because it is figured in relation to when the Jewish Passover falls in any particular year. But the 25th of Chislu is when the Feast of Dedication begins, and that is tomorrow. The 25th of Chislu is tomorrow. Hanukkah commemorates the purifying of the temple, the removal of the old altar that had been desecrated by Antiochus Epiphanes, who offered a pig on the altar. And Hanukkah celebrates the restoration of the worship of Jehovah by Judas Maccabeus in 164 B.C. Now, although the books of the Maccabees are not inspired, they recount for us the history of the Maccabean War. And we find that feast being celebrated at the time of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we find that Jesus was celebrating it in John chapter 10. The history is long. It's a very fascinating history. We won't go into all of it today. But that history is actually prophesied in the book of Daniel in detail. Daniel prophesies the rise and fall of four great empires. The Babylonian Empire, the Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, and he prophesies that the Greek Empire would be divided into four pieces, and one of those pieces would be what we know as Israel. And he gives a great deal of detail to that one section which is under Antiochus and which ultimately will be under the Antichrist, of whom Antiochus is given as a forerunner. Finally, there's the Roman Empire and its renewal in the last days. Perhaps if the Lord tarries, we'll someday do a study of the book of Daniel, which is actually history written in advance under the prophetic power of God. But for this study, so that we can place the Passover in the context of the feasts, we must describe Hanukkah, which is also the Feast of Lights, Feast of Dedication, three names for the same feast. And it's this, 
In brief, Mattathias was a Jewish priest who lived in a small village called Modin in Israel. Antiochus sent an emissary to command Mattathias to offer a pig, a sow, upon the altar to Zeus. Instead, Mattathias was enraged. He took out his sword and he killed the emissary and he and his four sons, of whom the most famous is Judas, Judas Maccabeus means Judas the Hammer, of the Hasmonean family, began a war that finally drove the Greeks out of Israel. In John chapter 10, verse 22, it's clear that Jesus was in Jerusalem during that feast. He had been in Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles just two months prior to this. But now in John chapter 10, he is in Jerusalem for the Feast of Lights, known as the Feast of Dedication. It's no small matter that it was here in Jerusalem at the Feast of Lights. It was here in the immediate two preceding chapters that Jesus proclaimed that he was the light of the world. And then chapter 10 tells us that he was with his disciples in the temple at the Feast of Lights or the Feast of Dedication called by modern Jews Hanukkah. John 8 verse 12 John 9, verse 5, and then John chapter 10, verses 22 and 23. Jesus is declaring he's the light in chapter 8. Jesus is declaring he's the light in chapter 9. In chapter 10, Jesus is at the Feast of Dedication, which is the Feast of Lights, the Feast of Hanukkah. Let me read the verses. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Next chapter, chapter 9. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Next chapter, chapter 10. And it was at Jerusalem, the Feast of Dedication. And it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Now that's a very interesting context as we'll see this message is going to, I hope, if we can get through it, tie us back into the Feast of Dedication as we look at the Feast of Passover in just a few moments. So let's go back to Passover. What we've learned so far, number one, the lamb was to be observed for three days to make sure that it was perfect and without defect. Jesus was carefully examined also on that number three for three years and declared, even by the Gentile ruler Pontius Pilate, I find in him no fault. Number two, immediately after Passover is the seven-day feast of unleavened bread. In the Bible, leaven is the picture of sin. And just like the Jews must cleanse their houses of leaven, so we must cleanse our lives of sin. Number three, Jesus, the God-man, the one who is incarnate, the one whom we celebrate at Christmas. God in the flesh was without sin, though he bore our sins. But because he was without sin, he could be the perfect sacrificial lamb of God. Number four, then we saw the inseparable connection to the Feast of First Fruits, and we'll not go over that again, but First Fruits falls during Passover and specifically foreshadows the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so those three feasts we saw gave a foreshadowing of the gospel in Romans chapter 1 and 1 Corinthians 15, the elements of who Jesus is and what Jesus did. He is the final Passover of God's angel of death. The final Passover of God's angel of death. And all those who place their faith in him have eternal life. And those who reject him have eternal death in hell. Then we began to study the symbolism of the other elements of the Passover meal that God gave in addition to the lamb and the way that the Jews today celebrate the Passover. We looked at the meaning of the four cups at the Passover Seder. It's very important to understand the relationship to the cup that Jesus gave to the disciples at the Last Supper, and we'll be partaking of a memorial of that this morning. The Passover is described for the Jews in what's called the Haggadah. They have a special service for that. It describes the order of service. It tells the story of the Passover in the days of Moses. It contains specific songs and prayers. The four cups are a vital part of the Seder and one of its most important aspects. The four cups drunk at Passover remind the Jews of the four great I wills that God promised to the Jewish people in Exodus 6. I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. And then the fourth one, quoted in the New Testament as a prophetic future for Israel, I will take you as my people, and I will be your God. We saw Paul prophesy that 
as he quotes that passage in Romans chapter 11, and we'll be dealing with Romans 11 more in detail, so I give you in just a moment. But in verse 26 of Romans 11, and so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them, when I shall take away their sins. There is still coming a day for Israel, a day of power and blessing and deliverance and glory because Jesus is their Messiah. The third cup is the cup that Jesus used to symbolize the ratification of the New Testament. Last week we studied the family reasons also for the celebration of Passover. Passover is the Jewish holiday designed to teach the children and grandchildren of the next generation so that they will never forget so that they will never forget. God commanded them to teach these things to their sons and their sons' sons forever. And how much we should learn as Christians from that. It's always the youngest child who asks the famous four questions to the Seder leader. Why is this night different from all others? On all other nights we eat vegetables and herbs of all kinds, but why on this night do we eat bitter herbs especially? On all other nights we never think of dipping even once, but why on this night do we dip twice? On other nights, everyone sits up straight at the table, but on this night, we all recline. And as the leader recites the plagues one by one, everybody dips his little finger into his cup, places a drop on the plate, and when it's over, the ten spots on the plate becomes an object lesson reminding them about the ten plagues. The highlight of the evening is when the children search for the afikomen, the hidden manna, and we talked about that last week. A beautiful picture of the Trinity, three matzahs in a special bag. And the central matzah is broken and then hidden. And the children are sent to search for it. The boy that finds it, the girl that finds it, receives a prize. The leader must redeem the afikoman for value just like we must be redeemed by the blood of a lamb. Without realizing it, the three matzahs in the Afikoman unity bag give a striking symbolism of the three persons in the Godhead. The triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And just as the middle matzah was broken, wrapped, and hidden, the second person of the Godhead, the middle matzah, was broken for us. And it's a matzah. It's without leaven. It's without sin. Wrapped in his burial shroud, hidden until the entire Passover Sabbath is past. And then the women went looking for him, even as the children go looking for it. And they discovered that he had risen from the dead. And Paul reminds us of all that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We saw last week how afikoman means that which comes later. The rabbis say that that means dessert. And we pointed out that they know Hebrew, but they don't know Greek, because the Greek word afikomenos is in the aorist tense and means he has come. It's punctiliar action, point in time event having continuing consequences. He has come. He has come, not dessert. It's a picture of Christ who has come, been broken, died for our sins, been buried, and risen from the dead. The Lamb of God has come to redeem his people from their sins and to give eternal life, even as the cup of redemption, the third cup, spoke of. Now today, I've brought a show and tell. We're supposed to teach our children. Well, we did a lot of homeschooling, as you know. We taught our children. Judy mostly taught our children. She taught them very well. She used a lot of show and tell. And I have a show and tell that reminds me of dear Judy. Right here. This is a Seder plate. This is set on the table at the Jewish Passover. They come in different styles. This is one that I bought for her shortly after we got engaged. In the middle are the Hebrew letters. Matzah. That's the matzah. It sits there. And then you have six little 
holes around the edge. You can come up and look at it afterward if you'd like to. Those little spaces around the plate hold at every Jewish Passover six things. They may be surprising to you. Some will be familiar, but some have been added throughout Jewish history to remind the Jews and teach them different things about the Passover. The first is the Beitzah, which is an egg. You say, why in the world did they put an egg on the Passover plate? Because to the Jews, the egg symbolizes winter yielding to spring and life reemerging from seeming death. In the context of Passover, the egg reminds the Jews to mourn the destruction of the temple where the lambs are no longer sacrificed. But it is also a reminder, just like from death to life, it's a reminder that the temple will be rebuilt. Ah, oh, dear people, it's coming. The Antichrist is going to try to do it, but the real temple the one with the Lord Jesus Christ will be when the Antichrist temple is destroyed and Jesus reigns in Jerusalem. The egg is dipped in bitter salt water and then eaten. The second little place on that plate is called the Zerah. That's where the shank bone of a lamb, and you remember we pointed out that they don't have the lamb, they only have the bone. A shank bone of a lamb. And some Jews even use a chicken bone in that spot, which of course misses the whole point. It symbolizes the lambs sacrificed at the temple and the lambs slain in Egypt to protect the Israelites. The third little pocket is for the maror, the bitter herbs, usually horseradish. That's to remind the Jews and to teach their children of their bitter bondage in Egypt. And it is stipulated that it must be strong enough to bring tears to the eyes. And as they partake of it, it is so strong, it brings tears to the eyes. The fourth little pocket is for the karpas, which is a green vegetable, usually they use parsley which symbolizes the hyssop that was used to apply the lamb's blood on the doorposts and the lintels of the house. Also like the egg, it is dipped in salt water and eaten. The fifth is something I've mentioned before in the messages, the haroset. That's a sweet mixture of apples and cinnamon and spice that symbolizes the sweetness of freedom. The Hebrew word haroset means clay, and it represents the mortar or clay the Israelite slaves used to make bricks. And then the final pocket is for a root vegetable. Different ones are used by the Jews. But to symbolize the hard work that the Israelites did in Egypt as they dug in the ground. And so today, with that in mind, I want to take us on a whirlwind tour. A tour that will reach back into the Old Testament prophecy, tie us with the Christmas narrative, the Jewish feast of Hanukkah, the declarations of Christ for which they wanted to stone him, and the heresy of reincarnation. <laughs> You're going to do that in the next 20 minutes, right? Let's give it a shot. That brings us to the prophecy in Malachi chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4 verse 5 prophesies that Elijah the prophet will announce the coming of the Messiah. Because the Jews believe this with all their hearts, a special place is set at the Passover table for Elijah with a special glass of wine or grape juice. And in the middle of the ceremonies, a child is sent to the door to look and see if Elijah has come. Here's the prophecy. Malachi chapter 4, beginning in verse 4. Remember ye the law of Moses my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So why does every Jewish home set a place at the Seder table for Elijah at the Passover meal? A special designated wine cup called Elijah's cup, which is filled to the brim and put on the table for him. Nobody else can drink it. 
That practice had been done for centuries by Jews who knew that Malachi prophesied that Elijah would be the forerunner of the Messiah. They also knew that it was a fulfillment or would be a fulfillment of God's promise to Israel in Exodus chapter 6, verse 8. And I will bring you into the land concerning the which I did swear to give it to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and I will give it to you for an heritage. I am the Lord. When the Jews place Elijah's cup at the table, and every observant Jewish home does this at Passover, and even non-observant Jews often do it, simply because it's a fun time for the family. But they place a cup for Elijah. Why? Because they understand the principle that you must teach your children if you would see it go on to the next generation. You must. Some of you have seen the film Fiddler on the Roof, or perhaps even attended the musical. And one of the great songs in that is Tradition! Tradition! The Jews have not forgotten. Though they have been persecuted and hounded and murdered all over the world and millions of them have died, they will not forget God's covenant promises. How about your children? How about your grandchildren? How about your great-grandchildren? Do they know it? Do they know the covenant promises of God? What have you done to teach them? Oh, dear people, I love you. Don't let it die in this generation. At every Passover, it's the yearning expectation of the Jewish people that Elijah will come, that Elijah will announce the Messiah who will regather all of them into the land of Israel in peace. The millennium, millennial peace prophesied throughout the Old Testament prophetic scriptures. As I mentioned last week, that's why every Seder concludes with the wistful words, next year in Jerusalem. For they are not yet all home. And Israel, not America, Israel is their home. Next year in Jerusalem. At that point in the Seder, the youngest boy at the table has the job of running to the front door, opening the door, and seeing if Elijah has come. Their hearts have longed for him for 3,500 years to see Elijah standing there. Perhaps this will be the home at which he will first appear. But the prophecy of the forerunner has been fulfilled in relation to the first coming. Did you know that there are prophecies concerning the coming of Elijah that relate to the first coming and that relate to the second coming? We talk about the first and second coming of Christ and we see those prophecies. But did you know that there are prophecies concerning Elijah at the first coming and prophecies concerning Elijah at the second coming? Not at the rapture, at the second coming. Let's look at a little bit of that. The prophecy of the forerunner has been fulfilled in relation to the first coming. But Elijah will also be one of the two witnesses, along with Moses, that appears before the second coming at the end of the tribulation, when all Israel shall be saved. Romans chapter 11. Now let's talk about Elijah and the first coming. Let's talk about the context of it, where Jesus talks about it. It's the context of the transfiguration, which, by the way, is recorded twice in the New Testament, in the Gospel of Matthew and in the Gospel of Mark. Matthew chapter 17. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. Now listen to verse 3. 
Listen to who shows up. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias. That's the Greek way of writing Elijah. Moses and Elias talking with him. Transfiguration. Two show up at the very beginning of the passage. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias. <laughs> Peter ran his mouth an awful lot. But it lets us know something about what was going on. And this was apparently right around the Feast of Tabernacles because he wants to make three tabernacles here. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. Suddenly we have the appearance of the Shekinah glory. Do you find anything that's taking you back to what's been going on in the book of Exodus? You've got Moses. Yeah, he was there. You've got the Shekinah glory. Yeah, he was there. You've got a cloud that's filled with light but also has a shadow to it. And a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. In other words, Peter, stop talking. Listen to Jesus. And we would do well to do the same. Stop talking and listen to Jesus. When you want to argue with God, listen to Jesus. When you're out there battling about foolishness and worldliness and carrying on about something you don't know anything about, stop talking, listen to Jesus. Oh, how many of us run our mouths all day long and nothing but empty vanity comes out. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. Then Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. Death of Christ. Passover. Are you beginning to see a few things that are alluded to here in this passage? Feasts of Israel that tie together. And what's the very next thing the disciples ask? Matthew 17.10. He just talked about the death and resurrection. They've just seen Moses and Elijah. They've just been up on the Mount of Transfiguration. And verse 10 says, they're beginning to get a little glimpse. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias, that's Elijah, must first come? Hmm. Moses, Elijah, Transfiguration, Glory, uh, death, resurrection, they're scratching their heads. Why then say the scribes that Elias must first come? Takes us back to that passage in Malachi that we read just a moment ago. Verse 11. Jesus tells them something about the future and then he tells them something about the past. He talks about two comings of Elijah. Verse 11. Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things. In other words, it hasn't happened yet. Scribes are talking about that. Scribes have at least got one picture in mind from Malachi, and it's a picture that is still being celebrated at the Jewish Passover tables as they look forward to Elijah coming and announcing the Messiah is here. Elijah shall first come and restore all things. But verse 12, let me tell you something Jesus says about the first coming of Elijah. But I say unto you that Elias is come already, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. You see, the Jews overlook the things that relate to Christ's death. They take all the passages of the Old Testament scripture that relate to the death of Christ, like Isaiah chapter 53, and instead of saying, oh, that, the suffering servant of Isaiah chapter 53 is the Messiah, they say, no, the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 is Israel. And because they don't see Jesus in Isaiah 53, they do not understand that there would be a forerunner that came to announce the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John the Baptist is the one that did that, you know. 
John 1, 29. You say, well, how can you tie that to John the Baptist? Because Jesus did in the very next verse. Look at verse 13. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. Dear people, there is so much in Scripture that we just skip over because we know it. But we don't. Do you understand that that hearkens all the way back to the angelic proclamation announcing the birth of John the Baptist where that revelation is revealed and explained? It's not just Jesus saying here, did you know that the angel Gabriel explained it when he talked to Zacharias? We talked about the contrast last night between old Zacharias' unbelief and young Mary's faith at the Christmas concert last night. I wish you'd been here. You're missing a lot. Things you've got to teach your kids and your grandkids. When Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell on him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. Thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be, now listen, he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. There is the spirit spoken of in the prophecy of Malachi. And many of the children of Israel he shall turn to the Lord. There is the power that is spoken of in the prophecy of Malachi. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. That is the power of God. Now look at verse 17. Both those things are mentioned by the angel, Gabriel, as he speaks to Zacharias. And he, that is John the Baptist, your son, the one who's going to be born to Elizabeth, he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias. We have it in the Christmas narrative. To turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. He's quoting Malachi 4. That passage that the Jews are still looking to Oh, they want the Messiah who will give them glorious rule, who will restore them to their land. It is coming, yes. But they never see the things that God has written concerning the coming of John the Baptist in the spirit and power of Elias. The disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now that's where we need to stop and get into that ugly heresy that I mentioned a moment ago. There is no reincarnation going on here. It is a prophetic declaration of the power and spirit of Elijah manifested upon and through John. That was the same thing for that Elisha prayed for. You remember in the Old Testament? Elisha prayed for a double measure of the spirit and power of Elijah. And Elisha was clearly not a reincarnation of Elijah. That's in 2 Kings chapter 1. It came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth and as my soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, Yeah, I know it. Hold your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Jericho. And he said, As the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. And the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he answered, Yea, I know it. Hold your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Tarry, I pray thee here, for the Lord hath sent me to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And the two went on. Do you understand how intense he was for God's blessing? And he would not let it go. 
like Jacob who wrestled with the angel of the Lord and would not let him go until he got the blessing. Is that how you wrestle with God in prayer? Is that how you struggle for the blessing of God? Is that your heart's desire? If it is not, you will not get the blessing. As thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they too went on. And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off, and they too stood by Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters. And they were divided hither and thither. Does that remind you of anything else? There was a crossing of the Jordan before this. There was a crossing of the Red Sea before this. God split the waters. Elijah split the waters. They were divided hither and thither so that the two went over on dry ground. Verse 9. Verse 9. It came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Okay, you've hung in there. You've hung in there. Four times you've hung in there. Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, and here is the key to that passage where the angel speaks to Zechariah about John the Baptist. Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he, that is Elijah, said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken up from thee, it shall be so unto thee, but if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass, as they went on still, and talked, that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire, and horses of fire, and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more, and God took hold of his own clothes, and he rent them into two pieces. The chariot of God and the horsemen thereof. Psalm 68 tells us what that is. That's the Shekinah glory. The chariots of God are thousands of angels, the flaming seraphim. Do we see that at the Exodus? Yes. Do we see it giving light to Israel all night and darkness to the Egyptians? Yes. Dear people, the scripture is a unit. Elisha was not a reincarnation of Elijah. Neither was John the Baptist a reincarnation of Elijah. But the spirit that rested upon Elijah, the spirit that rested upon Elisha, is the spirit that rested upon, the, on John the Baptist. And that's what Jesus is talking about at the Transfiguration in Matthew chapter 17. And that's where that prophecy of Malachi chapter 4 has that double application of that which has been done and yet that which is to come. The two who appeared with Jesus in transfiguration, Moses and Elijah, are the two witnesses of the book of Revelation. And they prepare the way for the coming of the Messiah, who will redeem Israel, who will place them back, all of them, not just some of them, but all of them. Next year in Jerusalem, there will be a day when they say that next year in Jerusalem, and it will be so for all of them. That's all in our text for Passover. That's all in the text about the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb whom we celebrate this day as we partake of the Lord's table. It needs to be noted that the spirit and power of Elijah resting on him did not mean that he was a miracle worker. You know, it's uh, rather interesting, the fascinating, incredible context where it is specifically stated that that did not mean that John was a miracle worker. It's in that same passage in John chapter 10. We looked at it just a moment ago. You remember Feast of Dedication, John 10? Jesus in John 8, light of the world. Jesus, John 9, light of the world. Jesus, John 10, Feast of Dedication, also known as the Feast of Lights, or Jews call it today Hanukkah. John 10. It's in John chapter 10. In this same context, it brings us back 
to the Jews wanting to stone Jesus. They took up stones to stone him. Verse 31. He answered them, Many good works have I showed you for my father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. And because thou, being a man, makest thyself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said ye are gods? If he called them gods, unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said I am the Son of God. If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, though you believe me not, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. Therefore they sought again to take him, but he escaped out of their hand and went away again beyond Jordan unto the place, listen, where John at first baptized. And he abode there. And many resorted unto him and said, John did no miracle. How do we know John didn't do any miracles? Because the Bible says so. John did no miracle. But all things that John spake of this man were true, and many believed on him there. Oh, dear people, that brings us back in that full circle, back to John 10, back to the Feast of Dedication, back to the Feast of Lights, back to Hanukkah, with which we open the study. We don't have time to look at the other passage, but it's in Mark chapter 9 if you want to read it. And Jesus there again says, But I say unto you that Elias is indeed come, and they have done unto him whatsoever they listed, as it is written of him. That's that prophecy in Malachi. Why aren't the Jews able to see it? The answer is judgmental blindness. Their hearts have been blinded until the fullness of the Gentiles shall be come in. But even though that now they are in blindness, God has not cast them away. In fact, God inspired an entire chapter of the book of Romans to declare his faithfulness to national Israel. That's a pretty powerful declaration in one of the most powerful books of the New Testament. Romans 1.1, I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. Watch ye not what the scripture says of Amazing. Here we're back to Elijah. What well, the scripture says of Elias, how he make an intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets. Dig down thine altars. I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved unto myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so, then, at this present time, also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Jumping down to verse 25, for I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. Why don't the Jews see it? Why don't the Jews see Jesus in the Passover? We've looked at all the symbols that are there. We've looked at the Old Testament prophetic scriptures. Why don't they see it? Verse 20, 25, for I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so shall all, all, all Israel be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. Oh, there are many other places where the temporary judgmental blindness of Israel is stated. Second Corinthians verse chapter 3, verses 7 through uh, 18, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 and following. Specific statements of the judgmental blindness of God against Israel, but God's faithful guarantee that he will yet deliver them. Dear friends, though we didn't read all those passages, does that not strike terror in your heart? Judgmental blindness, that is. Are you in the plague of judgmental darkness sent by God himself? Have you hardened your heart to the one who has declared that he himself is the light of the world? Do you remember that the Shekinah was darkness in all the dwellings of the Egyptians, but it was light in the homes of Israel? And the angel of death passed over every house where the blood of the Lamb was over the door 
and on the doorposts. As we prepare for communion, do you know if the blood of the Lamb is over the door and doorposts of your heart? Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. How we thank you that he died for us. He took our place. He bore our guilt. He bore the penalty for sin that we should have had to have suffered for eternity in hell. He bore your wrath. He took the bullet for us. He died in our place. And then he rose from the dead, promising that his gift of eternal life is a true promise. It is yea and amen. And for all those who place their faith in him, they have the gift of eternal life. Thank you for the Passover. And we thank you that the angel of death has passed over us, who have placed our faith in Jesus, your son. In his name. Amen. In preparation for the Lord's table, let's take our hymnals and we'll sing the first and fourth verses of hymn number 413.